is love and the wife we may be here all day. Yes, I need to my delightful wish. L-O-L. On this International Day of Disabled Persons, I want to talk to you about inclusion and belonging for people with disabilities. Acceptance and inclusion of disabled people onto all walks of society is no doubt an important first step. But what we need goes beyond inclusion. Inclusion means just existing in the same space as non-disabled people. Disabled people need to not just be included, we need to feel we belong. Belonging is a sense of community, where you are accepted as an equal member of the group and where your life is seen as having worth. Belongingness in society is, I think, what we all yearn for at the end of the day, whether we are disabled or not. Starting today, let us all strive together towards belongingness for people with disabilities. I also wanted to point this little other thing out. I use this text-to-speaking voice called Brian. There are only a limited number of affordable natural sounding voices with an American accent, so when two non-speaking guys are chatting, it is like Ryan speaking to Ryan, which is very disconcerting, and a razor of the individual. Though there are a couple of human-based voice apps, they are kind of expensive. This is a point I want to highlight. There is no point in designing technology if it's inaccessible, hard to use or not easily affordable. We are talking about a population that has historically not been seen capable of holding high paid employment. To continue with my introduction, some of the stuff I get to do at UC Berkeley. We have some pretty amazing faculty and personally for me can the question for knowledge ever end. So I am enjoying every moment. When I joined the Daily Californian as a student journalist, I wrote my first column on autism because there was a lot to be said. I did not expect that my column would take off as it did. I'm genuinely curious and a deep thinker by nature, and so just kept chipping away and writing on the different issues I noticed and it looks like some of them have had a real impact, which feels very satisfying. I think I've written around 50 articles so far. I like to think I have played a tiny role in helping get disability more visibility on campus. Last year the Daily Cal had its first disability edition. And this year, I'm part of the Daily Diversity Committee initiative hosting workshops each semester on workplace accommodations for all Daily Cal staffers. Earlier this year, I was selected as a Haas Scholar, which means I get to do my own independent, fully funded, mentored, year-long research project. My project combines psychology and autism. I am so excited to get started recruiting participants for the study sometime later this summer. I hope many of you will sign up to participate. A rather unexpected thing happened while looking up existing research and scholarly databases for my project. I came across a research paper published by Oxford University. As I was reading it, I suddenly realized that something I'd written had been quoted in that paper. That was both unexpected and rather cool too. This fall will be my sixth semester as student instructor for a class on autism. I get to drive the class content and have made it more reflective of the beauty and complexity of the autistic experience that spans the lifetime and intersects with many different areas. The teaching is done in collaboration with one to two other non-disabled students each semester. I was also a student instructor for Splash at Berkeley, which is where Berkeley students teach short courses on various topics to high schoolers over a weekend each semester. I've been a research assistant at a couple of psychology labs. 
first at the Hunshaab, where I worked on ADHD and mental health, and then at the Golden Bear Mood and Sleep Research Clinic, where I worked on an NIH-funded sleep study. I'm also a research assistant at the UC Berkeley Disability Lab, also known as MATLAB at Cal. This is a unique makerspace lab, the only one of its kind in the UC system, hacking low-cost disability solutions and undertaking some much needed research and projects all centered around community feedback and needs. Our new logo feature is the Berkeley Bear, highlighting a disabled leg and full heart with the words, making better crips since 2018, underneath. I head team propaganda at the lab and I get to learn about other disabilities, which actually helps me understand issues around autism better. <laughs> I was a summer associate at Professor Victor Pineda's World Enabled, where I worked with other students on preparing case studies of countries that had implemented the UNCRPD, the United Nations Convention for Rights with People with Disabilities. Professor Pineda had been one of the youngest delegates and draftees at the original convention in 2006. Besides being able to contribute, it was very educational for me personally to see perspectives and challenges faced by countries at a global level. I've been part of the Campus Student Org Spectrum at Cal since my second semester. We adopted the new butterfly logo a few years back as autism is like a cocoon that morphs into all sorts of unexpected colorful butterflies. The butterfly effect says a small local change can lead to profound and complex changes around the world. You are all part of the butterfly effect that will change the way autism and other disabilities are perceived, understood, and accepted. For the last academic year, I found myself as the first non speaking president of Spectrum at Cal. What I'm most proud of is that despite remote instruction, Spectrum had increased its outreach, collaborations with external and campus orgs, and started a new peer to peer volunteering program. We were already at Acceptance Week two years ago. We renamed it the Belonging Week, which I am personally thrilled about, as I am very passionate about the belonging idea. That's me wearing a shirt that was designed by Tori Benson in our org that says, You belong, with two intertwined butterflies emerging out. I just love the imagery and message on the t-shirt in promoting belonging. If anyone is interested, the You Belong tees are available for purchase for a limited time. My positive Berkeley experience has, in large part, been because no one has ever said no to anything I want to try or do, which makes all the difference. I do a lot of creative writing, essays, short stories, especially poetry. Have written over 200 poems, won a bunch of awards including one at Carnegie Hall back in high school was published by Scholastic, etc. I love philosophy, and I do have plans for future books. My latest publication will be a poetry prose piece, titled, Survival of the Kindest, Truths from a Zoom Reality, the anthology, Essential Truths, the Bay Area in Color, is out on June 30th and has poetry, prose, and artwork by BIPOC writers and artists in the SF Bay Area. I want to emphasize that autism is not quite the linear spectrum that one is made to believe. A nonlinear spectrum translates to meaning that each of us is going to be permutations and combinations of different strengths and challenges which affect us in many areas and in varying degrees in each area. Social awareness, social communication, spoken language, pragmatic language, emotional connectivity, neuromotor control of body movements, sensory processing, executive functioning, monotropic mindset, compulsive repetitive behaviors, etc. I will use my own case as an example. In the previous slides you heard about all the good stuff I can do. On the flip side are my areas of challenges. And frankly these consume the majority of my day, which can make daily living quite and challenging. So but that does not mean I put all other areas of my life on hold. On the speaking front, oral motor apraxia is like there is a disconnect between the thought of my brain and the ability of my oral motor muscles to carry out those instructions. I can think of something, but often unable to sequence the words out of my mouth. In the meantime, the other person is staring at me waiting for me to output some words, so there is great pressure to perform the act of talking, almost like a spotlight effect. 
I get all flustered and anxious and may blurt out any random words. I use augmentative communication for the most part currently, but I long for faster and more intuitive communication technology that does not have to rely on a lot of motor ability. On the motor skill front, it's again like a disconnect between instruction given by the brain and the muscle doing the actual motor task. The result is poor fine motor skills. I have almost no handwriting skills, which can present challenges in doing the penmanship required for math and science. So while I enjoy math and science, it has been challenging to do the physical part of the work and have had to use various software. Any kind of technology is hard to manipulate when you don't have good motor skills and really slows you down as well. Poor <laughs> motor skills can also really affect your daily living skills, starting from buttoning your shirt I also have a poor body schema or body mapping. What this means is that my brain is not always aware of my entire body in space and time, which can be very disconcerting. Sensory dysregulation or the inability to process the environmental input efficiently is often what is behind all the atypical body mannerisms called stimming. Sensory dysregulation or the inability to process the environmental input efficiently is often what is behind all the atypical body <gasps> mannerisms called stimming. Compulsive and repetitive behaviors can really interfere and distract from being productive in daily living life activities. I also have a dual diagnosis of ADHD. Ironically, the ADHD need for novelty often clashes with the need for sameness in autism. Let's add in a bunch of health issues and allergies that I have, which I won't go into here. It is very frustrating that the mainstream medical community often want to dismiss off our physical and mental health issues as being part of this bucket of... So we can't or need not do anything about it. The effects of this neglect is going to impact uh, is everyone seeing or hearing me. Age. With all this going on, do you wonder that I have social anxiety and mood regulation issues? My body is not easy to manage. It's like driving a car with a loose steering wheel. It's societal potholes. It can result in anxiety, frustration, shutdowns, and the sensory meltdowns. The point is that there is a multiplier effect of permutations and combinations of challenges that vary in degree and intensity and affect the ability to cope and perform and thrive. There are many intangibles. The issue at stake is that supports and accommodations target only a small fixed list of things to address. For example, a communication device will solve all my issues. But this is barely scratching what is needed. We have to constantly keep thinking of how to make small tweaks and other workarounds. These are some of the key issues I want to highlight today in terms of our theme of improving opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Last November, I had written an essay for Alice Wong's Disability Visibility Project on authentic and positive media representation, including a context of more systemic issues. The link to the article is on the slide. I would like to reiterate some key points. These observations are based on existing findings that have been around for quite a while. In each instance, think about parallels to disability. The I'm first the idea of workshop evaluations required by RSA subgrounds so that we may be changing. Like a study looking into self-perception of race, black girls had identified white dolls as preferred and good, while black dolls were less preferred and associated with bad. That study went on to becoming part of the testimony used in the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court ruling. The point, how we are labeled, how we are portrayed will influence how society treats us. It also influences how we think about ourselves and how visible we are and how much our voices get heard. Everyone deserves to feel good about themselves and that they are part of society. A case in point is the use of the very stigmatizing and dehumanizing functioning label of low functioning water. Okay. Being branded low sets you up for low educational expectations, low societal expectations, and gatekeeping from the get-go. It sets you up for lifelong failure. No one willingly labels themselves as low, 
it is others doing so. Law then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as shown in the Rosenthal and Jacobson study way back in 1968. Someone's expectation about a person or a group leads to the fulfillment of those expectations. When teachers were told a certain group of randomly selected students would do better, they did end up doing better. A better performance was attributed to the teacher's behavior. By extension, if a teacher is given a child with a low prefix, unconscious bias will translate to lower expectations for the rest of that individual's life. In addition, terms like low will cause an almost priming effect as shown by Higgins, Rones, and Jones 1977. In that study, one group of participants were exposed to, or primed with, negative words like reckless and stubborn, while the other group was primed with positive words like adventurous and persistent. They were then asked their interpretation of a person after reading a rather ambiguous description of that person. The positively primed group had a positive image and vice versa. Similarly, in the 1966 Barg, Chen and Burroughs study, when participants were primed with elderly words, they walked slower after leaving the experiment. The point, labels influence outcomes remember, I is a problem too as it is a relative term, its presence implies some sort of superiority and its absence indicates its opposite, which is low. So we must get rid of both labels. Clinicians, educators, scholars and therapists still routinely use these functioning labels. So you can be part of the solution by helping change the narrative. For Black History Month, I had interviewed Professor Frank Worrell of the Graduate School of Education at Berkeley. He is also the president-elect of the American Psychological Association. Obviously me being a disabled student and him being an educator, one of my questions was when he thought about the state of special education and minority education, and if there was one area to address, what would it be? I want to read you his response. I think the assumption is made that if you need special education, it automatically means you can't do certain things. I think in some sense this parallels ethnic minority communities. Recent research on teacher expectations has shown that those expectations actually have profound impacts, not just on individual students, but sometimes on whole classrooms of students. But that research has also shown us that we can teach teachers to be high expectation teachers. We know the kind of things that high expectation teachers do versus what low expectation teachers do. Most importantly, we need to teach teachers, and special education teachers in particular, as well as teachers who are teaching low income and students of color, that they do not need to assume that they know what the ceiling of the student's ability is going to be, that they need to meet the student where they are. A critical part of teacher education is that teachers do not communicate low expectations to students, but actually engage with students so that in fact students can make go to the highest levels that they possibly can. To recap his response, expectations is a critical issue that influences outcomes. The good news is that research has helped identify things that high expectation teachers do versus what low expectations teachers do. We can use this information to make changes. While the above question was asked about special education, it has broader applications for any program with respect to disability. This was something that was discussed in my stigma and discrimination class. Of course, a lot of this work is around race, but the parallels to the disability community is too obvious. So what leads to institutionalized discrimination amongst blacks? Negative racial stereotypes associated with black students makes it more likely that teacher will view infractions by black students over time as a problematic pattern, which heightens teachers' concerns and escalates harsh disciplinary treatment. This study is by Professor Jason Okonova, who is a psychology professor at Berkeley. Okay, so he was a Stanford professor at the time of this study. Basically, in this study, teachers saw the same set of reports about the repeated problematic behavior of a student. Just the names were changed to make it sound like a white student versus a black student. Repeated infractions by the black sounding name were seen as part of a problematic pattern by the teacher and seen as deserving of harsher punishments. The same was not the case of white sounding students. 
Basically, the negative stereotypes associated with black students meant they got sent to the principal's office more often, which is a path to suspension. Repeated suspension in time becomes a clear school to prison pipeline. Drawing a parallel to special education, I will quote Professor Wuerl from the previous slide when he said, the assumption is made that if you need special education, it automatically means you can't do certain things. If you are thought incapable by your teachers, so will the rest of society. All gates of opportunity will close down for us. So Professor Okonova and others set out to see if changing teacher mindsets would change outcomes. Indeed, when there was a shift in teacher mindsets towards empathy, it ended up drastically cutting down suspension rates. The study took a two-pronged approach that both addressed structural conduits, the inability to get students' perspectives, and mindset conduits, fixed beliefs about students. A key strategy they used was also reminding teachers why they entered the profession in the first place. Teaching is supposed to be this noble profession, where you really want to make a difference, you never come into it with the expectation of making money. Somewhere along the way this message has gotten fudged. This study was done across many schools. I don't remember the exact statistics, but the results were impressive and there was a huge decline in suspension rates. I want to draw parallels to special education and to transition programs. If we can work to reprogram teachers and professionals, shift their mindsets so that disabled students have better outcomes, it will be a win-win for everyone. <laughs> Independence does not have to be the hallmark of success. It's a little unfair to have to bear the pressure of, oh, you must be independent in every little aspect of your life. Or we, the lone ranger who can exist on his own island, hunt and cook our own food. The reality is that the name of our disability may mean that some or many of us will need degrees of support in different areas at different points in our lives, or maybe even all our lives. And that's okay, we can't be made to feel guilty because we have not reached some tall order. What Professor Sonora Taylor said in her Disabilities Studies class about independence really resonated with me. The reality is that all of us, disabled or non-disabled, actually exist on the spectrum of dependency and interdependence. The other interesting thing is the difference in the way independence itself is looked at. For professionals, it's about the ability to perform daily tasks like eating and toileting without assistance. Disabled folks, on the other hand, think of independence as the ability to make decisions about one's life. Berkeley has been such an interesting educational experience for me, and I get to learn from amazing world-class faculty. When I was taking Professor Hinshaw's developmental psychopathology course, we covered a number of neurodevelopmental disorders. As I was going through the readings, I would keep thinking to myself, why are we called developmentally delayed? That seems to imply some kind of global delay across the board. Surely we should be termed developmentally all over the place. I even told Professor Hinshaw my theory and he agreed. What does developmentally all over the place mean? It means we are ahead in some areas, on par in some, delayed in some and may never catch up in some and that's okay. What does this translate to? You should not hold us to a middle of the bell curve timeline. Different things may be picked up at different times during our lives. It's never too late to try something and you are never too old. We are going to live to 80 years of age, so we got the time to learn and try all kinds of things. We live in a capitalist society where the worth of an individual is often tied to how much education you have how much money you make and how much you are contributing to the productivity of the economy of the country, etc. So disabled people are not just made to feel like they are somehow less or deficient, but this justification is used to discriminate against them. For instance, I was turned down by the Department of Rehabilitation in my senior year of high school as they felt I would not be able to hold down a job, which was very discouraging to say the least, and so glad I just carried on without their support. But why should this be so? Worth should not be based on ability to contribute. Some can't contribute in the traditional sense, due to the nature of their disability, and that's totally okay. I want to reiterate by pointing to the words on the t-shirt that Spectrum Student Org made this year, which read you belong. Dear disabled peers, 
No one is an expert on you. No one knows enough about your autism or other disability to be an expert. Even the experts are still learning. So, no one gets final say on what your limitations, needs and capabilities are. No matter our challenges, we all want to lead productive lives. Part of this sense of accomplishment and satisfaction comes when we feel that someone else has benefited from something we have done. By volunteering, we enrich the lives of others and build our own sense of worth and self-esteem at the same time. The irony is that disabled people are often seen as incapable of volunteering as it requires too many social skills. We are seen as the recipients of volunteering rather than the ones you get to volunteer. But why should we be excluded from activities that have dual benefits to both society and yourself? I want you all to think and pursue traditional and non-traditional ways to volunteer based on your individual strengths and challenges. Shifting gears, I want to talk about communication. In my mind at least, I think of the ultimate goal of communication as giving agency to the individual. And I base much of my observations of my disabled peers that I have observed over the years and continue to interact with. So I tend to think of communication in three levels. And these are fluid and by no means discrete levels. The one we are most familiar with is the basic ones, which are self-explanatory really. There is a big stress on this which is critical and great. Problem is, educators and therapists and caregivers stop at this level. Because you see, it has taken care of the needs of the caretaker. It's basically like taking care of a pet who can tell you if it wants to go outside to play or for a walk to the park when it's hungry or wants to go to the bathroom or a favorite toy or TV program. And a few basic emotions like happy, sad and mad. Stopping at this level is a disservice to the disabled individual. For instance, if that individual is using, say, an icon-based approach, his whole life revolves around 50 icons and the average lifespan is almost 80 years. The next area is the one related to academics, job, vocational needs, or maybe even some kind of skill that that person enjoys or is good at. It is important to build success no matter how small. Our life can't be all about deficits only. Thus, communication skills in this area can really lend to helping build self-esteem for that individual. For instance, going to college is a big accomplishment for me and it boosts my self-confidence no end. I never imagined it possible when I was in special education in middle school. I am not great at most other areas in my life, but I am successful in these few, which is what kept me going. But at the top of the heap of communication is the ability to express thoughts and opinions. This is what real life is about. This is agency. But most importantly, it's the ability to say no. So, why is learning to say no important? What I have observed is an overemphasis on compliance in special education classrooms. In fact, my observation is that adult day programs prefer the compliant individuals because they are easy to take care of. I say this based on observation of peers I have grown up with. Day programs love my friend who basically just sits in a corner and does not demand anything. On the other hand, my other friend, 25 with behavior issues, he's been stuck at home since he transitioned from the post-secondary program because day programs don't want him. His parents simply don't know what to do. The problem with compliance is that you are not taught to say no as you always have to obey your therapist or your educator or whatever adult that comes your way. This is a real problem as it sets up many for abuse as adults, sexually and financially. And for much of our lives, we will be surrounded by caretakers who themselves may be frustrated as they are terribly underpaid. <laughs> the case manager found a service provider on top of a disabled individual who lived in supported living when she paid a surprise visit. This is a true story about an acquaintance with high support needs and terribly upsetting to hear. Non-disabled kids learn to rebel, to say no during their teen years. They learn to say no in a safe space against their parents. And though parents may hate it and complain about it, it's an important skill that these teens carry into adulthood. They also have the coping mechanisms of gossip, confiding in other peers, letting off steam in different ways that many disabled students lack. 
And I do want to point out another interesting thing. Talking back and arguing with the instructor is a skill that is encouraged in elite schools. Professor Jason Orkunafa, who is black, had gone to both inner city Memphis schools as well as an elite high school in Rhode Island on the scholarship. He points to the contrast that in the Memphis schools, they expected compliance and the kids were checked every day with metal detectors and suspended if they acted up or talked back. On the other hand, at the elite school, they were encouraged to talk back and argue and negotiate as that is a skill required of leaders in the industry. Disabled students never learn to say no. Sad to say, despite all my education, even I can get easily intimidated even if the logical part of my brain thinks otherwise. I would directly attribute it to the heavy focus on compliance in all the therapy I have gone through all my life. The point. The aim of teaching and encouraging communication has to be about getting to the thoughts and opinions, coping skills, agency and importantly learning to say no. This is a troubling but important topic. Employment for disabled people is not just about finding a job but the fact of systemic disincentives to holding down employment. One is the way the current SSI system itself is set up. The benefits themselves are so limited and existing services are not easy to understand or navigate. For example, I'm currently an SSI and state Medicaid recipient and our pharmacy still has not understood what is covered under Medicaid as it is so complex. So with each new pharmacist at the counter, multiple iterations of conversations are needed just to pick up that month's medication refills. And all kinds of approval paperwork is required. How stressful is that month after month? Then there is irony in that major research hospitals like Stanford or UCSF will not accept state Medicaid insurance when it comes to mental health. I'm currently covered by my dad's insurance, which covers only 80%. All of which adds up with each visit to the Stanford Neuropsychiatric Specialist for Med Management. Do disabled people not have mental health issues too and need coverage? From the way I see it, many, many autistics end up being medicated in the name of behavior management only to be faced with the irony of it not being covered. Then there's the dental coverage. Disabilities like autism, for instance, are accompanied by sensory challenges, which means for many like me, Many dental procedures are impossible unless we are totally sedated with anesthesia. One of my autistic friends has been handed a $7,000 dental bill because he needs anesthesia for a tooth cavity procedure as parental insurance and state Medicaid will not cover anesthesia for dental care. Do people with more support or other needs not need dental health care too? On top of that, SSI is the asset limits, restrictions on how funds can be spent and complex reporting requirements. You can save only $2,000, an amount which was set in the 1980s. Yes, while you can have one able account now, you still have to keep track of every expense, and they have to be very disability specific, and the IRS can audit you anytime. Basically a lot of stressful paperwork on top of dealing with all your disability issues. The fear of losing this basic safety net even though it is so limited in nature, if you work, is a terrible, terrible disincentive towards employment for people with disabilities. It's a complex system to understand and to navigate for someone like me who desires to work but will also have significant and lifelong support needs on many fronts. I feel that autistics like me are neither here nor there, which is not a good place to be. I'm often told that you should not worry about losing state insurance when you start working as you will get health insurance from your employer. But as we can see from the examples of insurance our parents have from their employers, it is filled with all kinds of costly deductibles and co-payments all of which end up, in addition to not adequately covering dental, vision needs or mental health needs. All these hidden costs act as disincentives to employment. Disability also comes with a lot of support costs not associated with insurance or other covered services. The choice should not be between living in poverty and state services or having the capacity to make a ginormous salary but you can brush off all state disability supports as you can more than afford to self-fund not just all your disability supports but also all the co-payments and the deductibles and the things that insurance will not cover and still have enough left over to enjoy a decent quality of life.
there has to be a happy medium for others with disabilities, so everyone who desires to work can do in the field they want, without worry over losing essential disability <laughs> services. Overhauling the SSI for disability program has its limits, Medicaid and other rules must be updated to bring us out of poverty. Hopefully the HCBS bill being introduced in Congress is going to make a dent in this area. I urge you all to reach out to your Congress representatives to get behind the bill. This is just the first step along with a whole bunch of other changes that are needed. These are changes we all should be advocating for. On the subject of accommodations, this quote really stood out to me from Judy Human's recent memoir. The book is a powerful read. Part of the problem is that we tend to think that equality is about treating everyone the same, when it's not. It's about fairness. It's about equity of access and equity of access looks different for me. When this is not understood, we get framed as complaining, even though we are asking for the same rights as everyone else. Understanding this equity of access will be a key in understanding accommodations when it comes to non-traditional disabilities like autism, whether in education or employment or in other areas. In my disabilities studies class, we discussed accommodations for the more traditional disabilities. Removal of architectural access barriers, for instance, are understandably a critical issue for traditional disabilities. There are many tangible and concrete measures in terms of what has to be done for implementation. It's a uniform application even if there are initial high dollar costs. But what do accommodations even look like for autistics? Accommodations are going to be nebulous in terms of uniformity of application as each person is unique in their level of support needs. There could even be clashing accommodations for two different people. Everyone is not calmed down by the same thing and some things can make it worse. So whose needs get priority and who gets to decide this? This is an important conversation for our generation to work on. I want to really stress this point. Professionals, educators and providers, you are game changers. A starting point is a growth mindset, an emphatic mindset and a long-term view. Our long-term quality of life and how society will treat us and the opportunities open to us will be influenced by how you help us, guide us and treat us, the message you give about us to others around us, how you help us think about ourselves from a young age and be able to advocate for ourselves. I like to think of myself as possibility, Hari as possibility. I want you to think of disability as possibility too. Only when you think possibility can the door of opportunity open. I want to leave you with these words. Can the quest for solutions ever end? Never answers the mind. Emotions in the sensory body are sinkholes in root. Mind urges. Take detours. Challenge the sinkholes. We must persevere. Have to travel possibilities. Open opportunities. And pave new roads. Thank you, Hari. That was amazing. I think we have a question um, from the email. And I did forward it to you. And I did forward it to you, Hari, you should have it. Um, the question is, what are some factors and circumstances and who are some people in your earlier life that you credit to con contributing to your overwhelming success? Did our captioner cap capture that or do I need to repeat that question? The best part was that Parents are undoubtedly our best advocates, especially in our early years, and for many of us will be a constant for a lot of our life. The best part was that once they realized that I could do more, they really helped push towards my goal of accessing mainstream education. 
ability to communicate and pushing that communication to thoughts and opinions level makes a huge difference. Parents don't have much knowledge coming into autism so therapists who show that there is a path ahead helps both the parents to guide the path and get the autistic on that path. Some amazing therapists who have made a huge difference for me draw attention to Cherry, Leanne, Jenna. Thank you for that. That was the only question that we received in the email. If you had any other questions, please go ahead and send them um, on the email for uh, seep at desi.mo.gov. So, um, Hari, I think that's the last question for right now. If we have more, I will get them sent to you. If you want to stay um, on, we're going to switch to some of the other experts that we have um, on the call. Um, but Hari, stay stay on the call so that if we get more questions in, we will go ahead and, and forward those to you as well. So I want to introduce the rest of the um, experts that are um, attending this session today. We have um, Amy Bowen from Voc Rehab, and we've got Connie Cromwell, Jay Webster, uh, Robert Simpson, Sally Knox, um, Samantha Marzikovater, and Samantha Scott, Susan C., and David Baker. Um, if they want to say just a little bit about um, their organization, um, you may, or if you have any questions for uh, any of those presenters that had sessions earlier in the conference, um, those people are on to answer questions from um, earlier sessions, or if anybody had any questions for these um, experts on um, their particular areas. So welcome experts. Thank you. My, I'll go. My name is Amy Bowen, and I'm the director of uh, transition services for vocational rehabilitation. And um, the goal of vocational rehabilitation, um, we support individuals with disabilities uh, in, achieve, in achieving successful employment outcomes. Um, that's the goal of our services. We serve individuals uh, and students who are in high school uh, up to adults. Um, so if you have uh, individuals who are interested, uh, students that you're working with who feel that can benefit from our services, we have multiple um, services to offer. We do individualize those services and we offer pre-employment transition services as well as transition services. I'd be happy to go next. Uh, my name is Bob Simpson. I'm with the University of Missouri's pre-employment transition services. We work very closely with vocational rehabilitation uh, to help promote positive income outcomes for students uh, in, their, in their future. Uh, oftentimes we work with students uh, prior to uh, VR referrals, but we really see ourselves in partnership with students, schools, uh, employers, communities, and the various agencies that we work with. So uh, you may have encountered, and it's been referenced in many of the sessions, our uh, pre-ed specialists uh, around the state, uh, working with uh, well over 500 uh, school buildings across the state. And uh, even in this COVID year, uh, over 4,000 uh, students this uh, past year. Um, so that's us. Thank you, Bob. All right. Well, I will jump in after Bob. I'm David Baker. I'm the director of Missouri Assistive Technology, which is the state's federally funded assistive technology program. Uh, many of you on the call may be familiar with us in some capacity through either our ETC device loan program for school, that school districts access or our assistive technology reimbursement program that I know a lot of school districts who are participating have probably taken advantage of. Um, but we offer a wide variety of programs and services all focused on assistive technologies. So if you aren't familiar, I encourage folks to get more familiar with those by visiting our website at uh, at.mo.gov or just giving us the call. But one thing that we're extremely interested in is um, assistive technology as part of the transition process. That student that is using a text-to-speech software 
software or an augmented communication device uh, is going to need that through their entire life. And hopefully people are keeping assistive technology in mind as they work on transition issues. And Hari, I'd just like to congratulate you for a very nice presentation there. So Pat, do you want to field one of the questions in the chat box or would you like some of us to keep talking? Um, let me go ahead and field this question since it has to do with bulk rehab and Amy's already spoke and then I'll let you take it next. Okay, Sally? Um, a question in the chat, in utilizing voca uh, vocational rehab, can they help provide non-school district job coaches for students while they are participating in community-based programs during high school? Um, I would, as far as uh, job coaching while they're in high school, um, we provide services. Um, there, there are some different schools, school-based programs that have supports while they're in school. Um, what, I guess, what community-based programs are you referring to? And that question was there are, that. there are some supports in place for students. Um, as far as um, providing services, again, they'll, they'll all be individualized. Um, but I guess, are you referring to a certain program? Uh, yes, I thought I would just um, talk so I can better explain. So um, our community-based instruction program where we have students going out in the community working with job coaches, um, you know, we have paraprofessionals that we're training as job coaches right now to go into the community. And then a struggle that we have is providing enough job coaches to increase are, you know, the amount of students we can get out and working in the community. So I was just wondering if like Voc Rehab would be able to help provide job coaching for students in those work, ex volunteer work experiences that could, you know, lead to those paid employed, paid, paid employment. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do have uh, some programs set up into place, but as far as you know, we would need to talk to you about what programs are, what's available for the students, what supports are in place. Um, we only provide job coaching to students who are participating in a vocational rehabilitation program with job placement services. So, um, again, if they're participating in our program, um, we would... Um, we may, be, we may be able to do that. We can't provide supports for school-based programs. So if it's a school-based program, we wouldn't be able to provide that, that job coaching for that school-based program. Okay, so it'll only be post-graduation. Correct. And we do have a Project Search or EBTT if your school is participating in that. We have those programs um, where supports are in place. Um, so um, they're, they're wrapped into those services. Um, but as far as job coaching services for a school-based program, we would not be able to provide support for job coaching support for that. Okay, thank and we you. Can talk some more. We can talk some more if you have questions about that. Thank you. Okay, thank You're you. You're welcome. There, um, Hari um, wanted me to share, he had some additional information. Uh, from his response to the earlier question. And he says, also people who helped me get internships and other opportunities that helped improve my self-worth. Um, and VG um, from Access Braille. I ended up being editor of an Access Braille magazine uh, Madhu Krishnan from inclusive, from inclusive World. And when they first started the organization, I helped develop their website, mission, vision statements, such things made me feel I could be productive and really move ahead. Also, soon after I learned to communicate, I got a national gold medal, which I received at Carnegie Hall and which got published by Scholastic In Incorporated. I mean that anthology had a forward, a forward by Ellie Weasel, who is a, a Nobel laureate. 
um, talk about a confidence booster for me. And I kept winning awards for my poetry and writing. So all of those factors kept me feeling successful. So thank you for that response, Hari. And I know that I have seen some of your poetry also out there on YouTube as well. And it's, it's amazing. So if you want to check that out. All right. And Sally uh, Knox from Impact, you're going to tell a little bit about Impact. Yeah, thank you, Pat. So Impact is, I'm Sally Knox, first of all, I'm the program coordinator for transition age um, programs and efforts with Missouri Parents Act or Impact. We are the parent training and information center for IDEA for the state of Missouri. Um, we work with families and youth through special education process to help them understand self-advocacy and how to advocate for their own child. We presented twice at TTI this year. We had Cheryl Thompson who presented on the graduation handbook as well as Lisa Bowles who presented on regional transition networks, um, resource mapping through those transition networks and then also how to like establish and get connected with those. I have already received a few different emails from people who have been through TTI this week who are interested in either connecting with an already established RTN or interested in receiving more information how to get one running. So that's great. So at this time, you know, if you have any questions, Pat can field those to me and we can try to help you out. Also, Lisa and Cheryl, um, Debbie, if any of you are on the call and you have to uh, information to contribute to any questions that come through, I'd also appreciate your feedback. Okay, I have another question in the chat. What are some practical strategies for training teachers in the area of high, low expectations and their effects on students with disabilities? What works for today's educational climate? Does anybody wanna to volunteer to take that one? Uh, well, I don't, uh, wouldn't call myself an expert in this, but I would take a stab at it to say that um, ex expectations for students with disabilities and various challenges, it really starts with leadership. And um, so uh, on a building level, getting your uh, building administrator behind your efforts is uh, key. Um, and then I think there are a lot of resources out there that can help with that. A lot of different agencies, and, and many of those are represented here today, um, all the way from impact to uh, pre-ETS to uh, various uh, RPDCs and uh, other resources, state agencies around the state. Um, we have to advocate uh, for kids and for opportunities of course, there'll always be barriers and challenges, but when we come together um, as a community, uh, for example, in RTNs, um, we can help uh, kind of move uh, that forward. But I really think it starts with uh, leadership um, and, and getting your leadership to believe um, in the students. I hope that answer made sense. Someone else help me out if, if it didn't. Okay. No, I think that made a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, do we have any other experts on our panel who haven't spoke yet that would like to share? Uh, Cheryl, it looks like you have your hand up. Cheryl, did you want to say something? Cheryl Thompson. Can you hear me, Pat? Yes. You know, I just wanted to add on to what Bob said. It is absolutely important for the leadership, but it's also important for parents and teachers to get our students ready by being an assessment capable learner and teaching that student where they are, where they wanna be and how to fill that gap, whether it's a high performer or a low performer, um, and we wanna remove the label anyway, but letting that kid be able to know where they are, where they need to be and individually fill that gap is where we all wanna to do to support them. All right, thank you so much for that. Did we have any other questions from the email? We have one I just put in the chat. Okay, we have one more question on the email. So this may be for Hari? No, this is to no, everyone. No, it's to everyone, okay. 
Um, okay, so this question says, I am a special education teacher at Western Missouri Correctional Center. I have had one experience with Boke Rehab regarding one of my students. He was being paroled. I knew he would need uh, to receive services upon release. I was told that my student needed to contact Boke Rehab himself upon release. Is there any way to coordinate services prior to an offender's release? Several of my students have been in some sort of adjudicated placement since they were young juveniles. They do not know how to navigate the real world and many will not be returning to supportive environments. Thank you, Lisa Clark. We are currently working um, with DOC on a reentry program and coordinating services with individuals who are um, coming out of uh, facilities and uh, working on getting those services going. Um, so we are in the process of working on reentry and we are part of that process uh, and working on that with DOC. Um, so, um, we could get you um, connected with um, the counselor that is in the north, you're in St. Joe. We can get you connected with uh, the vocational rehabilitation counselor who is um, in that area. Um, that could be a contact person for you. Um, let me, if you can, um, send me your email address, I would be happy to, to get you some additional information, Lisa. Thank you, Amy. Um, there was a question in the email about um, sheltered workshops, and this one was directed to Hari so that we could get his personal perspective. Um, if you had gone through any kind of um, sheltered workshop or work experiences like that, and what was your um, view or opinion of that? I have not gone through this, but it's a bad idea. Why should be of less worth? That's what the TCU bill in Congress is advocating for. Happy to have also have advocated for this amongst congressional staffers as part of my Archie training at Austin in summer 2019. Okay, well, thank you for that perspective. Do we have any other questions from the email? No? And did anybody else see any questions in the chat that I missed? I didn't, but I just wanted to go ahead and introduce myself. Um, my name is Samantha Scott, and I am the Transition Services Coordinator with Re Rehabilitation Services for the Blind, um, and our agency helps individuals with vision loss uh, work towards their uh, employment and independence goals, um, and we work with um, children. We have a children's services program that serves youth with vision loss ages birth to 21 um, and offer pre-implement transition services as a part of that program. And then we also have uh, another one of our programs, which is our vocational rehabilitation program, which helps uh, individuals with vision loss find um, competitive integrative employment in the field of their interest. Um, and so we work and provide different pre-employment transition services, um, including a variety of different programs. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Do we have any other experts that we haven't heard from that would like to um, share? Uh, my name is Samantha Marsakovateri. I am the Director for Program Services for Missouri School for Severely Disabled, and our program is designed to help individuals uh, with uh, most significant cognitive disabilities um, succeed in life. Um, and so if you have any questions on uh, what our services have to offer, please let me know. Thank you, Sam. And I'm Connie Cromwell, and I am Special Ed Improvement Consultant from the South Central RPDC, and I'm here representing the um, Social Emotional Learning for All 
which is a partnership between DESE and the University of Kansas to get social emotional learning in our schools. So. Okay, thank you, Connie. Okay, and I am Susan C. I um, presented Check and Connect. I'm a Check and Connect trainer for the Northeast Regional Professional Development Center. Check and Connect is a complimentary program that re-engages students that are at risk of dropping out. Um, it's housed at a university, uh, Minnesota was the one. It's been in existence for over 25 years and it is a best practice. What Works Clearinghouse has done research on this and this is one of the programs they have found that does make a difference in students' lives. I would encourage you to talk to your Regional Professional Development Center about Check and Connect. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else that we haven't heard from that would like to share out about their program? Or have we heard from everybody? Is Jay or Jeff on here um, to talk about Missouri Connections? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Hari has Hari is asking, how can we improve adult day programs uh, so they don't seem more like uh, babysitting? Anybody on the panel want to comment on that? I think that's a very um, very good question, at Hari. And that is something that we probably need to look into more. And but the the situation right now is, I'm not sure if anybody who runs the day programs is in the panels um, to help really clarify that. So hopefully soon we can integrate um, them into this conference as well. Good idea. Thank you. Well, I think that seems like that's about all. Oh, something else just popped up. Um, I have a question about earning and retaining benefits, especially if your disability needs are high. Who do we go see at SSI office? SSI is kind of like a black box. Is there a specific position for this? What does one go to for low fee con consultants who can help given disabled are not that rich? And um that actually that's also a great person to put on this panel as well um we do have uh some connections with individuals who deal with ssi um, i'm personally handling ssi and ssi uh claim uh, with my daughter right now um so that is absolutely another fantastic resource and i appreciate um those questions because um, that, that is a, a huge reality of, of dealing with uh, the income and then dealing with the benefits and how it um, fluctuates. Uh, Missouri does do a pretty good job at trying to bridge that gap, um, but uh, we're getting, uh, it does get very difficult. So thank you very much for that question. Absolutely, Cheryl Thompson, contact your representatives. Okay. And those are some great um, ideas for our TTI Institute for next year, um, adding somebody to talk about social security um, benefits, because again, it's a transition from um, you know, school to um, life afterwards, the post-secondary transition process. So that's a great suggestion, and adult, along with that adult day care or adult day programs. So those are some great things to include for next year. So I appreciate those suggestions. I just wanna thank everybody for attending today. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. And if you have any additional uh, questions, you can always um, email them to me and you all have my contact information through EventSquid and you can send them there or you can send them directly to me and I will answer all of those as they come in. We will be taking these recordings and putting them with the closed captioning and offering those 
uh, posted on the website as soon as those are all put together and ready. So thank you all for attending TTI in 2021. And it's been a challenge this year with being virtual, but we appreciate everybody being here. And I hope you have a great summer. Thank you for attending.